Hi, welcome to the final Open Security Summit session in December 2022, 7 p.m. in London, 2 p.m. in New York. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to talk about the success and failures of security training. So uh, I'm Dennis. I've been running the, the summit for a while. Uh, Isaac, quick intro from you. So I am currently the principal security architect at uh, Squarespace, and I have been uh, developing and running a number of uh, training programs. Oh, and Chris. And Chris. So Chris Romeo, I am the chief security officer at Security Journey. Um, I too have been <laughs> developing and running a number of training programs. Uh, so I was at Cisco for 10 years. I built Cisco's internal application security training program. Uh, it's called the Cisco Space Force now, but it was called the Cisco Security Ninja back in my day. And then I started Security Journey to bring the same ideas about how do we how do we train developers out to the rest of the world. Cool. Actually, for, for reference, I used to do a huge amount of training, you know, for a while before I got into my latest stint of, of, of management. I I would do a lot of developer training. Um, you know, in the UK, I trained some very large companies. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the strategies that I work. So, Isa, do you want to kick this off? So success and failures of security training. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to be like very upfront and honest. Uh, to me, it's very interesting to, to be having this conversation with Chris on, on two different levels. Currently, Squarespace is a happy customer of a security journey. And before that, I, I had met uh, Chris at a number of uh, occasions, but I distinctly remember a, a chat of ours about, this was back in 2019, I think, the current status of security training. And I think that the, the example that uh, we we had brought up together was uh, cryptography. You go into like your normal cryptography training module and you get 45 minutes that explain everything about the MN and P and Q of the RSA algorithm. And we kept asking ourselves, <laughs> why do we think the developers need to know this, right? And Chris had already by then developed his approach with uh, security journey. What was, it was very just in time. It was very, easy. Listen, these are the, the ciphers that you have to use, that you can use. Here's what you should do and what you shouldn't do. You, you should get a library and use that library, a library that has been vetted and tested and all that. And I found that that approach was extremely uh, uh, fresh and exactly what I wanted my developers to go through. So I carried that in where I was at the time and now it's Squarespace. And Compared to what was there in place before, it was it was a, a tremendous success. People are very happy with what they get. But still, there is that jewel called developer time, and they are not willing to part with it, even when it's something that you want to put in front of them and say, listen, you have to get security right, right? Because as Jim Manico is fond of saying, every developer from developer now is a security engineer. They are in the front line. The code that they put out front is the first thing that customers meet. So they need to get the security thing right, but they are still not willing to put in the time. They, 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 they are still saying the training that you're giving us is not concise enough, focused enough. The questions are not, the labs are not. I, I, I hear a lot of uh, no, but nobody tells me what yes. And still, we have this huge corpus of knowledge that we need to part with these people, that we need to get them proficient in. And apparently, we are not finding the right solution. We, are, we have tried gamifying things. We have tried lectures and, and whatnot. What is it that we can do different? Well, I think, you know, to, to kind of start... There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff there to work with. Um, but, you know, kind of as a, as a starting off place, there... We we have to acknowledge the fact that we want to do we want to provide the best possible training experience for those developers, but we're ne we're never going to get to the point where they're hundred percent happy. I'm convinced. I'm convinced we're never going to get to the point where where all the developers take a survey and seven out of seven they all say we have the right amount of security training, right? So so I think from a structural point of view, we have to start this conversation by saying what what do we have to like, like, what are, what are the what are the ultimate benefits for the company, and what do we need developers to do from a security perspective to contribute towards those goals and objectives that we have? We know we live in a world now where, I mean, how many breaches were announced today? 
<laughs> the day we're recording this. Like there's a couple big ones that came out that are getting everybody's attention. And if we if we peel the, that back and we and we start deducing what happened when that invest that incident response report comes out, there will be some security vulnerability that maybe was a result of a software decision the developer made or a design decision. And those are all going to point back to the fact that somebody didn't have enough education, whether it was on the infrastructure side, whether it was in the in the code they were actually writing. And so I guess my first thing that I want to just challenge us with is to say, we have to we have to draw the bar. And I'm with you. I never want to you know, one of the maxims I live by, I never want to give a developer something that doesn't apply to them, that takes more time than they need to, because all of us here, we know that developers have a finite amount of time to do the things they have to do. And their primary job is to build awesome stuff for our customers so that our customers buy more stuff and the cycle continues and, you know, we get paychecks and everything else along the way. So, but, but the key is we're never going to, we're never going to get to the point where they're agreeing with us that yes, we've hit the right amount of training, but they know the risk right now. Like no developers is looking at the breaches that happened today and going, ah, that couldn't happen to us. My code, my code would never be susceptible to that. It's not happening today. I, I, um, oh, sorry, Gunter. yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I've, I've seen people just try and deliver training uh, for you know, for developers, for for people across across businesses, and and it kind of just doesn't stick. And I think there's you need that awareness piece there first, right? So firstly, it's that you're not infallible. This is going to happen, and this is an example of something happen. Um, you know, some something that happened. What I usually like to do is get an example of a company that is very very similar in size to customers, and then go through. Um, go through a hack with them and, and show them how it happened. So go through that purple team exercises. Um, it's a great opportunity for training because if you've got a good purple team test who's gonna sit with techies and developers and show them where they could improve, then that's that's training, right? That's, that's, that's you know, that's gold. Um, but also as well, you can train through standards. So if you're creating good security standards as a business and, and keeping those updated and relevant and, and right and easy to read, you can link to training from the standards to say, you need to have this level of encryption, you need to go read about this here or go off to OWASP and have a look at that. And they, you know, you can read about it there. Um, so it's it's almost like I'm not I'm gonna say it, it's holistic. You know, it needs to it needs to kind of reach out all those you, you know yeah. your, your standards and policies your testing your awareness piece that's all training um and i just found that feeding people training just doesn't just doesn't work just doesn't stick yeah and i want to piggyback off something else you said just to really quickly um I, I simon sinek is is an author i've read a bunch of his books and i took one thing away he has a book called start with why and one of the things that's at the core of my approach to training is start with why. Don't tell a developer, here's the algorithms you need to go and understand how to use. Tell the developer, hey, we need to use a good algorithm because if we don't, someone might be able to grab our, download our information and easily access because they can just reverse whatever the, the algorithm is that you chose. So start with why is one of those fundamental things that I think James talks, it speaks right into what you're describing here. Well, and it's giving context, right? So. I think what, what, what was interesting is that, you know, when I was doing a lot of training, I, I kind of started with the more traditional training, with the more, you know, I had 700 slides, I had lots of content, I had lots of even some whys. And then what I realized after doing a lot of training was that the best part of it was when we talked about their apps and the best part is when it became in contact. So I know this doesn't scale, but the, the, I end up delivering training where I was almost start by doing a live threat model of their apps. And I would almost, I would go around the room literally and ask everybody who they are, just anything true, but also what systems they were. And I would catch on systems that I knew was reasonably meaty, especially when you had multiple parts of the teams. And because we had the developers in the room, we would literally say, fire up your laptop, let's, let's do a threat model on top of an existing app, right? And what was really cool was either they already had some issues, but usually sometimes we would actually discover issues during the training. And what would become very obvious for me was that there was a moment where they were almost absolutely ready to consume everything. Because at that moment in time, they understood why it matters. So, and, and then when, and the thing that was also very relevant was that 
and, and I think in security we should take this challenge is that it, it's really not on to go to a team and talk about, for example, injection if they are in nodes and you're not talking about node specific injection or you're in .NET or you're in a particular language, right? Or you're in PHP or whatever language or Go, right? It's almost like you, we need to really customize the materials to A, the platform is the language, the environments they have, and B, the maturity of where that team is, right? So, you know, you might have a team that has no understanding of security and they, they, they're dealing more with the fundamentals, but you have a team that actually knows quite a bit about security. They are review security as quality. So we need to adjust it. So I, I think the, the real training is the training where it's almost not really forced on them. It's one that adds a lot of value because we are teaching them more things about the environment that they already code on. So I found that when you can do that, it's actually very interesting. They don't push back. The problem with that is that we need to find a way to scale and a way to actually do that at scale. And, and, and I like sometimes to follow the incidents and the vulnerabilities because again, they are real and they, you know, they can relate to it. You know, so if you have a bug bounty program or find a bent test or you have some incidents, those materials are amazing training materials because you can go deep. You can actually look at the root causes in deep about why something happened and then distinguish between, well, this was a mistake. So, you know, that's a bit different, but actually this is a pattern and the pattern is broken. And can you guys understand why this is actually a broken pattern? And, and you know, this was inevitable that this will happen because you are playing with fire and you are forced as a developer to get it 100% right. Now, they go, well, is that a better way? I go, yeah, prepare statements or certain types of frameworks or other things. So I think the, the customizing the materials to the audience, you know, actually across all the levels is key for this to work. So let me try to timeline here because I, I, I heard some great things from each one of, uh, of you, James, Dennis, and, and Chris. So if I take James correctly, he appears to be saying that a lot of the difficulty that we have in is basically in marketing the training. Right, because we are not showing people, hey, this could happen to you, and see how this thing that looks like you actually got hit. So learn from that. And then Dennis is saying that, hey, we have the content and we are presenting the right way. And if people are not uh, uh, taking advantage of it, it's because they they can't relate to it. So we go a bit back to the marketing thing, but then we close with what Chris says that we will never get to a situation where seven out of seven will tell us I loved training because yeah. human nature. Some people just like to say I don't like stuff. Some people don't understand what they're saying. Some people can't relate to it. And we keep going back to that relate thing in the marketing, in the content and in the, the, the feedback. Mm -hmm. So now what's ringing in my head is in part something that Chris has written uh, this week or, or a week uh, before, I don't remember exactly, about do security people need to know how to code? And I'm relating that to something that I wrote a couple of months ago about my journey as a security practitioner, talking about a bit of empathy and a bit of perspective taking. And my question now is, do we keep looking at this problem as security people and we keep trying to solve it as security people and we actually should be looking at it from the point of view of the developer and try to solve it as developers. What, what could we do differently if we adopted that, that angle, that perspective taking of, I'm not a security practitioner trying to impair and to impart knowledge from the Olympus. Mm -hmm. I am a developer trying to learn the same because I need it for my job. No, I think you're, you're right on there. These are like, one of the things I've been thinking about is like, what is the value proposition for a developer? that's going to participate in the training program. Mm -hmm. Like so often we, we look at it with our security colored glasses on and we think about it like, what's in it for us? Well, we're going to get developers that are going to, going to have lower vulnerability counts. They're going to patch third-party software faster. They're going to do all these yeah. things, but who is that for? Who benefits that? We do as the security teams out there. And so I think, I think you're 100% in the right direction here of, we got to be thinking about what's in it for the developers. Yeah. And the, the way I think about this, the way I approach it is, and back to the point you just made about marketing as well, like this training thing inside of a big company or even a small company, this is a program. 
you got to run it as a program. This isn't mm -hmm. just a one-off effort where you, you buy some training, you download something from OWASP, you load up Juice Shop or something, and you point developers at it and say, go. If you do that, you're going to have very, very, you might have a little bit of impact. You're going to, it's, it's not going to be a long lasting impact. You got to wrap a program around this thing. You got to brand it. You got to give it a name. You got to make a mascot. You got to buy some swag to hand out to people. You got to get people excited about wanting to be a part of this. And like, for example, that's one of the things I did at Cisco. So it was the Cisco Security Ninja. I bought lanyards that were the color of the belts that we handed out. And when somebody finished a level, in the early days, I would literally hand write an, uh, one of the inner office mail. Who remembers inner office mail? Holy cow, mm -hmm. does that even exist anymore? Not at all. <laughs> but I would write people's names on an inner office mail, put a lanyard in it, and send it to them. You know what they would do? They would take it out, they'd put it on, and they'd walk around. Yeah. And another developer would say, Where'd you get that cool lanyard? Oh, you're not going to believe this training thing. It wasn't so bad. I did this training thing and then I got this lanyard. Oh, I want a lanyard all of a sudden, but it's marketing, it's program. It's, it's putting the developer first instead of saying what's in it for us as security people. That's so cool. So, so now you're talking about incentive, which is different from taking their perspective. We, we are trying to find a way to motivate them to go and take this training, which goes beyond uh, because I told you so. But that's sure. why I feel that if you customize it, like the, the, the thing, okay, I, I, there's a couple of things that I, you, you're you saying is, that, is like, you know, realistically speaking, right? If you are trying to give security advice to a developer team, right? And you and no, and don't understand development, that's a no-go, right? Because the, the best advice is in context, right? So, you know, if you don't understand how certain languages work, you don't understand how certain frameworks work, you can provide good security guidance because the developers are going to ask, okay, how do I do it correctly, right? So if you're saying that this way is unsafe and here's the side effects, cool. What is the recommended way of doing it? And you have to understand technology. You have to understand development. You understand that platform. Now, this actually means that the best people to create security documentation are actually developers themselves, right? It's actually somebody who comes from a development background that is an expert in that language, they mm -hmm. are the best ones to write because they know it, right? And, and, and especially because, you know, the thing about security is that a lot of times what we want to do is quality, right? Like we, I, I, I remember meeting teams that were so advanced that the concept of security for them was very alien. Not that they didn't care about it, it was that everything that we care about security, they would do it. They wouldn't do it sometimes because of security, they would do it because it's a good engineering practice. What, what you mean you mix code and data? What you mean you don't authenticate things? What you mean you take, you know, you don't have strong schemas for your form so you can put a, a gigabyte of data in, in the form field, right? What you mean you don't, you know, you don't use prepare statements? What do you mean you, you, you keep secrets in your source code? Like, you know, all that stuff are engineering practices, right? That ultimately tie in with quality. I, I think in, when we talk about security training, what we want to make sure is, A, I think there's a raising the bar across the board, but eventually what scales is to, to make them better, right? To, to give them good engineering practices because the teams, the, the challenge of teams a lot is they have a, a, also a turnover of people, right? So, so I remember that so some training we, we did was, was really cool because we started to provide training specific to the particular framework they had, and that became the best documentation that they had about their own framework. And when somebody new came along, they go like, hey, if I can watch this or go to one of these things because, you know, we don't, we don't code sprint framework. We, we, we code our flavor of spring framework. So if you want to hit the ground running, you need to understand how the hell we code, right? Or how to do the DevOps pipeline or how to integrate this. And I feel that security training should add that value, should be something that is not shoved on a developer, should be part of the developer own training because it's almost teaching them best practices. You did link it directly in with, so that is mixing it with the incentive of performance reviews. It is a measure of that person's, you know, how, how well they're doing in their training, how they're progressing, how they can evidence that. Is that something that should be included in developer performance reviews in order for them to get bonuses, promotions, those types of things? I'm going to, I'm going to vote no only because it's, it, it can have a negative. So we don't, we don't want to have a negative response for anybody. When it, from, from a security perspective. But I've spent the last you know seven, eight years of my career thinking about and talking about security culture. Like how do we build a strong security culture? And I, I've, I've never seen in my 25 year career a successful um, performance review being used to, to drive good behavior. 
right? Performance reviews are about me finding the right set of things I can write down to ensure I get my bonus. And if I don't get my bonus, then it's going to be a result of me writing something poor and something that I should have should have added something easier to my review. Um, so yeah, I'm not a negative reinforcement person because I think I think while it will have a short term impact, it's not. I'm talking about a long term impact. How do we change the, the the culture of security inside of an organization over years? And it takes years. Nobody anybody tells you it takes six months is lying. Yeah. This is a multi year thing, especially, you know, as, as you add tens of thousands of more people, it's literally like turning a battleship like it. You're yeah. not going to make a quick left turn, hit your turn signal and go. You're going to go. It's going to take a long time to go around. I do want to react to one other thing. Izar, you mentioned about kind of we were trying to bring us back to motivation. I'm going to posit that motivation and incentive are intertwined. Mm -hmm. So can I motivate, I can't motivate somebody without like somebody has to have some type of extrinsic or intrinsic reward. That could be an intrinsic reward of, Hey, you're just going to, your uh, security executive is going to call somebody on the phone or jump on a call, a team call and say, Hey, I'm just here to celebrate this person doing something awesome. Right. But then it can also be an extrinsic motivation where it's like, we're going to give you a hundred dollars or a hundred euros or whatever, if you finish, you know, a particular level of training. Um, but, but all the way back to motivation and incentive, I think are there, there, there's no way to, to, to decouple those two things. Completely agree. Now let me, okay. Let, let me put to you guys a, an idea that I've been toying with for a bit. You are all aware of those communities where people go before they even get hired and discuss the whole process, interviews, and uh, take-home exams, and all that, right? So for a while, I've been banging on the note that most places that I know, at least, when they interview a new developer, they don't ask about security. They ask about building black and white trees, and red and black trees, and balancing whatever, mm -hmm. and pointers and whatnot, things that have died already. Nobody uses this, but they are the standard of acquiring knowledge about this person that we call a developer. And we don't ever ask about security. My question is, if we started trying to push the culture in a way where we ask developers about security as they are being selected, not for selection, but to give them the idea that security is something they, that they have to know, we, we are still going to, 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 to get them Security, is not, security knowledge is not going to be a gate to get them, but it's going to be something that we are going to gauge as part of checking if somebody is somebody that we want to work with us. Do you think that this could drive the culture to incentivize them to learn security in their own time, even before they get to our companies? Is that a, a, a shift that would be powerful enough to get people to actually go and sit down and get security training even before they, they come in? Because once they are in, their managers don't want to give us the time for them to, to learn. We are going to have to, as security people, we are going to have to, to, to pay for every minute that we take away from them. I, I think that's an extension of, um, of what Chris was saying of, of the machine, right? Um, I, I, the, the place where I see that working is actually already a place that already has a very good security training and posture and, and education because it's a machine, right? It's an operational machine to get to training. And training, you know, training is an opportunity to, to give, to teach something new, right? So you need a machine that bakes in training as part of the development workflow, right? The program should, that Chris to mentioned. be honest, security should just be one of them that goes in, right? You know, and again, you know, sometimes I feel that in security, we, we, we pay for the cost for companies not having mature workflows in other places, right? Like in a way, it, a developer team, sh an organization should have a mature training program, not just for security, for security, for CI, for quality, for work-life balance. There's all sorts of stuff that developers should be learning that makes them better. And security is one part of it, right? I think the, 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 the evolution of a company who does that is to start putting some requirements for security before the, the, you employ somebody. Because given the choice, you much prefer to hire a developer that has security experience that doesn't have security experience. But, and, and I, to be honest, I have seen this and I would love to get some data on this is that the more developers understand about security, the more they understand about quality and about other things. I, I don't think that security is a, a linear add-on to a developer. Mm -hmm. I think the developers understand security. 
they they have a much more holistic way, not just of security. They have of other things. They understand data validation. They understand data structures. They understand you know architecture in a much better way because security, especially threat models, guides you that way, right? And unless you talk about very esoteric shares of security, like you know cryptography and other things, um, but but I, I I like the idea of having you know security as part of the recruitment process, right? You know it just drives up the the quality across the bar but but but, Dennis, but where is it that we are going wrong then that when we are interviewing people we expect them to be fully understanding of issues of performance in the language that they they are coming in for but we don't have the same expectation for security what what, what is it that in the culture is different and that what, what's the lever that we can change i can tell oh. you i can so and I found that, oh, sorry, I found that there's two. I, I, I've tried to try to articulate this in loads of different ways, but that in, in to, to condense it, security is taking things apart, coding is building things, and there's two different mindsets that kind of developers have to switch between when they're doing this. So they have to, even though they're even though they're building security in. This, to build something in and to do that, they still they still have to have that mindset of how to take it apart. Um, you know, because you know, why would you why would you code better encryption processes in all this type of stuff? Um, so there is that there's that mindset of we're we're really good taker aparters, they're really good builders, and somewhere in that there's a conflict, um, which you know, we go into security for a reason. They go into development for a reason. There's two different. There's two different mindsets, and it's bridging that mindset. I think is 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 going to whoever works that out is going to crack it. I I think that I understand what you're saying. Where I'm going to disagree a bit is that a developer that understands security fundamentals, like Dina said, is a developer that that writes higher quality code. Quick example, okay? We all know that for security reasons, it's great for you to always check whatever you get back from a function, right? But it's not only the static code analyzer that's going to say, hey, you're not checking. The linter will too, because from the standard of the language, that's something that should happen. And developers choose to actively not do that in some cases, because they say, oh, I know that this is going to always work. And we know that the security thing happens when that thing doesn't work in those occasions that that thing doesn't work so so i, I can challenge you on that one man and i i i did some development stuff recently and i had to say i actually found sometimes security being a curse <laughs> because no, 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 would, no, for sure for no, sure no 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 but, but let, let, let me let me work this a curse on the point of view that i would write insecure code and sometimes i would think my 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 sanity would be much better if i didn't actually know that it was insecure but the reason why I wrote insecure code at that moment in time was a combination of the type of proof, proof of concept it was, but more important, the type of environment that you have, right? So what, it's almost like, I think sometimes it's easy to throw the, the developers on the bus uh, because it, you know, I almost say they want to write insecure code or they don't have knowledge on secure code. And to be honest, like the, CI, the, C, the CI CD pipeline today has more to do with the security of the code that they have than if they are a security expert. But you talked about the, the, the POC and you talked about the, the special environment. And I would offer that that's not the production code. On the other hand, yeah. if they have the knowledge of those security fundamentals that we want to train them on, and they understand that one of those fundamentals is you always check what you get back, right? That's quality code, that's clean code, that's code that's six, month, uh, six months from now, somebody can read and actually understand what the heck is happening, right? And they didn't have to become breakers or, or security people and actually understand how is it that somebody would attack this. Yeah, but for example, an, an application that doesn't have a good test-driven development setup is much harder to code defensively the way you describe yes. it, right? Yeah. And and that's the problem. So 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 again, and, and I remember once having this conversation with these, these upset guys, and I, I was basically saying that you they were like, we we go in, we train, we do threat models. I, I said, no, you go in, you spend that money, and you fix the CI pipeline and you build them a test framework. Right? You, you the, see, those, 
Yeah. That's exactly what you said, to code defensively. Yeah. My, point, my point is we shouldn't be coding defensively. We should be coding. The defensive yeah, but, is but, part but of that, code. But that, mm -hmm. that, the environment that the developers are sitting in, right, has a huge impact. What are they rewarded? How they are pushing stuff fixed? In fact, what is the code base that they inherited in the first place? Right. Remember that most code starts as a POC, gets thrown success, then gets given a huge amount of requests to do features on top of it. And the original code is still there fucking two years later. Right. And, and, and a lot of the times the, the education challenge in a way is, is, is how do we push the best practice in a way that actually and that's why I say it has to be in context, because you, you have to, to show how the path to code more securely is also the, the path to code faster, the path to, to basically to be more efficient. But sometimes the challenge is that you need a better CI CD pipeline and you need better test frameworks. And I, so actually I give you an example, I, I spent trainings where halfway through, I decided that instead of giving them a security training, I'd spend 50% of the time showing them what a test framework was and how it could work and how it would add value. Because I, I realized that all the things I could give to them on security, the one that will make a massive difference was for them to understand how to do test-driven development properly, right? And then actually I was doing then security testing through the test-driven development. So I was teaching them both things. And, and, and I think sometimes the training is a good example. Like, are we doing the training at the right place? Right, it's almost like if I have 25 credits to do training in a, in, a, in a team and you want to trace, you know, this is the thing in security, take a step back, right? What is more important to train that team? Is it on the latest exploits? Is it on, you know, the OS top 10? Is it on a couple of security fundamentals? Or is it training on the activity that is going to move the needle much stronger to the point where they can find the answers to those security questions? Yeah, but I mean, if you don't have the foundations, it's tougher to, it's almost like you're advocating for jumping somebody up the stack higher and teaching them something that the challenge I've seen is often we throw developers into that deep end without explaining the fundamentals and the foundational things and expect them to just be able to be successful. And so yeah. that's why I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of you got to layer, this is a foundational, we're laying foundational layers, yeah. intermediate layers, and we're making, you know, we're making that overall investment. Um doesn't necessarily answer the question that uh, that Izar was working back towards as far as this this interview process, um, but I think you know I don't know Izar that you're going to change the industry through the kind of recruitment process and you know the questions. I think it's a great thing to move try to move an organization towards asking security related questions of new developers when they're being interviewed. I think that's a great practice. I don't, I don't see how that's going to move an entire industry, but I think it's a small step. Wait, mm -hmm. that, that's the point. I don't want to change the industry. I want to change the candidates. When we start confronting them with security questions at the interview, they will have to start coming to the interview ready for that. Yeah. But that's one. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to get more, I mean, it, it, you, you got to start a movement though, right. For yeah. that to happen, because with one, you know, with your organization, even let's, let's talk about everybody that we're on the call right now. Like how many people, how many organizations do we influence? 10, maybe, maybe a couple of us can influence more than one. Um, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Like it's, we want to get the candidates to move, but when you think about like, I mean, the root of that problem, isn't the candidate. The root of that oh. problem is the, the university system. There's an article just came out this week that showed like no out of the top 25 universities for a CS program. I'm making this up. Do the research. Look up the article. I don't remember the exact, but it was something to the effect of like maybe one out of 20 or no, zero out of 25 had some type of cybersecurity focus in their CS. Yeah. You know where where it was a core kind of fundamental piece. I'm butchering the 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 I'm re of remembering what the article was, but the point it was making is that in the university system we're not teaching people security. So then they're coming to your interview or or out of, they're coming out of your boot camp, you know, say out of a dev boot camp. No one's even mentioned. They don't even, like you could ask them what is the OWASP top ten. Nobody's taught them in the university system. No one's taught them in the boot camp. So I think we got to go further back to ultimately solve this problem. This yeah. we got to go further back the back in the stack here yeah. i'm trying to i'm trying to think of is anyone has there been another area that's had the same problem with developers and solved it and the first thing that comes to my mind is databases 
So in the old days, you used to have database developer, uh, sorry, database um, administrators and developers and never the two shall meet. And then suddenly you've got developers and developers writing, you know, writing code that's talking straight to databases and doing loads of things and becoming and becoming much better over time. I'm just wondering, how did that, it was, is that a thing? Did they solve that already? And can we copy that? And I, I mean, there's I think database that, courses think, in the university the system, that, right? Like you, you, university system, like yeah, you you'll take a, you'll take a database course. Like, I think that's a pretty standard CS um, course for most university systems. So I think you might be onto something there, James, that might be how, that might be why we don't, we don't have DBAs anymore. Do we? I don't, I can't, I don't know any DBAs. Do they exist anymore? The developers now, man. Sort of. We, we, have, we have database teams that, that deal with like putting the database up and maintaining it. So they could stand for that. But I, I, think, WS, man. <laughs> I think that one, one thing, Chris, that, that I can offer there is like 10 years ago, I was teaching at, uh, at a university uh, um, security development seminar. And it was something that was offered for people at the, the master's level because the department didn't see it as something that those poor undergrads would be interested in. And what, uh, what I find funny is that at the same time that the, the university had a hacking club for undergrads. So I'm sorry, apparently they are interested in. And over the years, what I think changed is that today we have that separation, that clear separation between CS and software engineering at the university level. So a lot of people will tell you, hey, if you want to learn how to code, you don't go to CS. That's where you learn the math of the thing. You go to software engineering. That's where you probably are going to have exposure to databases and you should have to, to security, right? And there are some very, very good universities out there with amazing programs in, in, in sorry, cybersecurity. We have to say the word cyber at least once. So that's what they call it. That's, that's what it is. But uh, still it's, 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 it's baffling that to me at least, that people still come to this field knowing that security is a thing, that there is a necessity. Everybody pays lip service to security, but they are not willing to put the time in. They're not willing to go look for that extra knowledge. They're not willing, we are not willing to ask them about it because we say, if we start asking people about security in interviews, then we are not going to hire anybody. So th th there is an admission in there that there is a failure in the pipeline. So what, what, what I'm hearing from, from you guys now, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that from you, Chris, that there is the, the right realization that we need to treat secure, uh, security training as a program. Yeah. Something that needs a manager, somebody specialized in that thing that's going to look from A to Z and keep that pipeline going and keep people interested and keep throwing new things at them. And we have this very strong industry of uh, security training that's offering us labs and, and things that are nice to do, things that pull the, uh, the developer in as, as not as dry as a PowerPoint presentation and whatnot. And from then is I'm, I'm hearing that perhaps we should look at that step up from the program in the organization and, and start looking at the organization as a whole and say, why is it that this organization is not looking at security as something that needs the value that it actually deserves, right? So if you go to an organization today and you say, hey, your developers are writing code that does not perform as well as it should, it's going to be a carnival. People are going to be running around, hair, hair on fire, what can we do differently? But not so for security. Yeah, we had another breach, close it and move to the next one, right? So that, that, that's what I'm getting. We, we, we have a, multiple levels here that we have to attack this thing. And then I, I come from the side and I say, okay, let, let's add the lower level and give an incentive for the developer as part of the beginning of their career or going to a new place to incorporate that security knowledge. Can Is I ask there a question that on, on that last one? I, yeah. I still feel that the best thing that you want to do first to a developer is teach them how to hack, teach them how to exploit. And because and it's almost like if you want, um, I, I, I felt that if, if you want to get somebody interested in asking the right questions about security, show them the real side effects of security vulnerabilities. But, but that's different because if we go back to what James said, the, the different uh, uh, mindset, right? Between the developer and the security person. Teaching them how to hack and doing that marketing work that it's almost FUD of showing them how horrid 
security failures may be. Two things, two different things, right? And it's so, going so, to take. Oh, sorry. I sorry. I there was a bit of a delay. Go on, carry on. <laughs> Uh, I say, but something something that is also I found as a personality trait in developers and through experience is is they um, is competitiveness amongst their peers. Um, so where that's where tools like Juice Shop come in really handy. But then you can you can contextualize that because obviously Juice Shop, whilst it's very good, is very good for that type of application. You might be developing something completely different. Um, like internal internal bug bounties and hack days are quite yeah. good because then it's all it's all in context then and they're as well competitive they're trying to they're trying to be better than the people that have yeah. uh, really right but show them vulnerabilities in their own systems right like that's yeah. the thing right like that's the best part right and because look going back to other analogies right why does a database developer cares about scalability right because he has seen a database blow up right like so I, I sometimes think that it's not a negative, like, you know, why, why we, we say security is important because it has side effects, right? Why does a secret is important to care about? Because, hey, if that secret is leaked, then this, 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 this thing happens, right? You know, why, why containerization? It's, it's a good security solution for a lot of things, right? And then, you know, again, in a UI, why, you know, why do you design in a certain way, you know, because if you don't do it, you know, here's are all the side effects. Now, yeah, I know security has a property, which is, you can have a, a great full feature complete system that is insanely secure. So it's about talking the non-functional requirements, right? But it, you know, the, the, the advantage of starting with the attack side is, is it's kind of a little bit easier, but I think it's also changed a little bit the mindset of going, ah, now I see why that's a problem. So then they start, it, it's almost like, until somebody asks the questions, why should I bother? Why should I care that I'm coding like this? Right, it's very hard to give them a solution, right? Because sometimes the problem is the solutions in the short term might feel more complicated, might feel more steps. A lot of the languages they make it easier, the insecure way, right? So you know, is that where you're saying that? Oh, hold on, um, you know, uh, I want to validate the input I get from a web service, for example. Like I had a, a great success by saying hold on, you know, if you don't protect against that web service, when that one has a hiccup, you blow up, right? So forget about security, right? You know, things will go wrong. So you want to make sure that you defend, you know, almost that like you have a defensive attitude to the, to the old microservices dependencies, for example, so that if that one has a hiccup, right, you, you don't have a problem, you know? And I, I remember once seeing this team who designed this, show me this architecture, and by the time they finished, I said, great, but do you realize that you are a denial of service, you know, an agent for everything that you are consuming because you happen to be way faster and more powerful than all of them. And the other way around, if they go wrong, you collapse. So you, not only you, because they're building a new homepage for a, a very high traffic website. So it was very interesting that I was basically telling them, look, A, you have to do rate limitation on the way out but you also have to be defensive on the way in that you get the data or else you risk going to 20 places to get data. One of them, which might not even be the most important, has a problem and then you can't do your main function. So, so again, you know, is this security? Is this resilience? Well, it's, it's a mix of both, right? But, but this was a good example of showing the, that, that you, know, you need to start thinking about the stuff that can go wrong because security is sometimes about the non-functional requirements and it's about that resilience against stuff that can go wrong. But wait, I have to clarify something that you said. You started this by saying that we have to teach them how to hack, first of all. Yeah. Just to make sure that, are we talking about teaching people, for example, how to figure out how to exploit something? Or are we showing them what a hack is? Because the second part of your answer threw me more to that side. Yeah, showing but look, how showing how to exploit is the beginning, right? Like in a way, it's it's first of all, it's it's quite interesting because it's a puzzle, right? But you, you need to understand see, you know, okay, here's a website. How do you exploit the website? Right? Why, you know, even like the simple example of why HTML injection is a problem. Well, I guarantee you that as soon as they see beef, right, doing remote command and control from a cross-site scripting, right? Every time I've done that demo, they're going. Oh, okay. Mixing JavaScript with HTML—it's probably not really a good idea, 
But until you really see command and control, and it's quite funny, even when I explained to them, this is what's going to happen, it, it took you actually on your keyboard to issue a command that was executed on somebody else's computer through a, a cross-site scripting vulnerability for it to click, right? And I think it's important, right? It's, it's also, especially if you do it in context with the application that they are related to, right? Then it makes a lot more sense. Then they're going to go, shit, how do we do proper input validation, right? How do we actually separate code and data? How do we do these much better patterns? But you know, teaching them how to hack, you know, if, if you talk about the first level of, of awareness, I think it works quite well. I don't know, Chris, you've done a lot of big trainings, right? How do you start? What's your first layers of, of security awareness training? Yeah, I mean, my my general approach though is to layer the foundational piece pieces, the non-technical pieces. And the way I approach it is by saying, we're going to have everybody in the entire organization get to this same basic level. And so with that basic level, we're not going to have technical things. We're not going to do exploits and vulnerabilities and things like that, because I want a developer, a tester, a product manager, a program manager, executives to all get that same basic level of knowledge and understanding. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about things like what's the return on investment for security? What are the ramifications if we don't follow it? I'm going to introduce attacks and attackers and, and, exploits and, and give examples of that. Uh, but my, my approach has been, let's get everybody on the same page first, and then we can start to layer other things on top of it when everyone understands the impact, for example, a 50,000 person organization um, mm -hmm. of a single security problem. What, you know, what, are, what are the impact of that? And the reason we need to cover everybody is if we only talk about developers, then when they when they go to say, well, I need more time to work on security, what do they get? And their manager says, no, you don't. Yeah. Uh, the executives say, what are you talking about? I mean, executives are a lot better educated now about security when I got started 25 years ago where nobody yeah. knew anything about security. Uh, but still, you'll still get that pushback if everybody's not on the same page. Once yeah, again, I'm, I'm talking about security culture. How do we change? So I don't do security training. I do security culture. Mm -hmm. How do we change a culture of an organization over a period of time? And we do that by getting everybody on the same page and ensuring that they know that they start to see a shared vision for where we're going as well. Because that's that's where we get that big impact over a period of time. So, so I'm doing that a little bit differently where I'm trying to change that culture to risks and ownership, where I'm, I'm mapping a lot of the, the, the basic, even the standards, right? Even like, you know, why, why, why is GDPR? Or why is GDPR matters? Why does NIST matter? Why does, you know, PCI matter, et cetera? And then, and the policy that we've got, and, and we're connecting that with the risks of the parts of the business. And then that's how we do the top level education so that those, those individuals are going, I don't want these risks, right? I don't want the risk of having an application that can do this or have this vulnerability, have this thing. And I think you, it, it, but it's really cool when what you're doing there, where you bring the multiple people in the same room, right? And actually give them that awareness of actually what's going on. Because, you know, is our, you know, one of the best security trainings I've seen. Would I would actually argue the, the, the highest yield is threat modeling session. Threat modeling, especially again, you can you can do threat models that are not super technical, but you can, and, and actually I, I I I always find that sometimes the business users, once they understand what's possible from a technology point of view, they find some insane scenarios. Because they start to understand, well, if you tell me that this can be manipulated, well, the way I would exploit this is like this, 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 this. And then the developer's going, oh, if I can share. Whoa. <laughs> like, I didn't realize that my little piece of the puzzle would allow that, that, that. Because also sometimes the business owners understand the ramifications. They understand that if you can do X, then Y is possible. And actually, by the way, that X was the only thing that we were doing to, was our only control. Mm -hmm. on this so thread modeling sessions are amazing education in fact that's what i would do like i'll, I'll literally do thread modeling sessions in my trainings because it was a, a great way to do this but i always find that do a thread modeling where you already have a couple of vulnerabilities on your pocket where you can literally guide the aha moment throughout throughout the session where you already know where some of the gaps are and you start the thread modeling by basically it's training, right? But you're training them on threat model and then you guide them to that moment when they're going, that's not good. <laughs> I'm convinced I'm going to look at this threat modeling thing. 
Yeah, I think it should. <laughs> I, I, think I got a document. Should you should check out the threat modeling manifesto. It's really good. Yeah. I heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> Bunch of very smart people. Yeah. <laughs> But that's but that's also like you know what, what, think about what's the objective of training is, and I, I have to say Chris I really like the idea of security culture right I yeah. think that's that's a great way of and and I guess I, I guess how you measure it how you measure security culture right before yeah. doing and after great no, that's a great question I mean so it, it, when I think about measuring it in the early days I want to measure this based on just number of people that are attaining various levels in the education program. Because that's that's what I can that's what I can I can measure the number of facts that we're injecting into into the organization across the way. Um, I think you know one of the other things we want to be looking at very quickly is you know from a security perspective, flaw density. So how you know that's a number that I think we can measure, and I'm I'm kind of hyper focusing on an engineering focused company that's building products because that's where I spend the most of my time, but. You know, you start thinking about flaw density. That's a measurement of security culture. As long as I'm seeing and, and you know number of vulnerabilities per thousand lines of code or however we want to do it there, but as long as we're seeing that number trending down over time, it's yeah. it's a great metric because it's not like I hate I hate metrics of like oh well, we had 47 vulnerabilities last month. Great. We also had five people who were, you know, we caught their attention and they were doing free security research on our product for us and they generated a whole bunch of CVEs, right? So bulk measuring of vulnerabilities is just, it doesn't work because you can't, you can't decide who, you can't tell if somebody's coming after you. So great, great example of that from the, the history of the world here. I was at Cisco during the time when Felix Linder FX decided he was going to test Cisco stuff. And guess what? Our PCERT team was cranking out vulnerability notifications left and right because FX was really good at finding issues in Cisco products. Mm -hmm. If we had been measuring bulk vulnerabilities, we would have looked terrible. At the end of the day, we were actually, products were improving because somebody was act actively testing and working through our PCERT process and getting things fixed. And so, you know, that's how I think, you know, from an engineering organization, a big thing I want to see is, are we, are, is our number of security issues per thousand lines of code in a downward trend? It doesn't have to jump, but is it trending in the right direction? That's, yeah. that's the primary way I'm measuring security culture. And you always want to see, oh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Go. Also, if you make that more granular and you look at specific classes of findings. So if you see you, you having less XSS over time, you having less nowadays still some people have buffer overflows over time and you calibrate that together with the material that you're actually teaching, that helps. But one thing that uh, I, I have seen at, uh, at uh, what we're using here and that turns out to be very uh, illustrating is the training is asking what's your perceived level of knowledge before you take the module and then asking again at the end after the assessment and contrasting that the difference between those two numbers, which is self-assessed with the result of the assessment that was put in front of the person as part of the training. I find it extremely, extremely interesting because it's showing me that people are tending to come in with an overblown sense of how much they know and then they get exposed to the material, they get tested on the assessment, and then they come and say, okay, apparently I didn't know as much as I thought that I did. And that leads them to go with a better mindset into the next module. So I think yeah. another, yeah. so, so obviously as metric culture is very, very difficult, isn't it? Because it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling, isn't it? It's a, it's how it's perception and it's very difficult to measure. And I found, that you know when you've, you you know when you've when you some of the actions you're bringing to an organisation are working when all of a sudden those uh, things that are found in QA um, in testing uh, when events are being reported go bang straight up because suddenly people are coming to you and they're engaging you and that's good and then you want to see that trend down so you almost want to see the mountain right but also and this is I I found that this is it's completely unrelated. Uh, well, it, it's a little bit high level, but the ha measure the happiness of your security team. Use EMPS. If you've got a happy security team, then they can see their work adding value into the areas that they're looking after um, and not mm -hmm. stressed out that they're just hitting a brick wall all the time. And that's a that's a really interesting measure that I found. If you've got a, a security team that's hitting their head against a brick wall with developers, they're not happy. 
um, the happy to happy set teams are, are engaging with the business. They feel part of the business. Andrea, do you want to chip in, right? Since you, you know, you're, you're, you're here, do you want to give us some of your views on this? First, brilliant to hear you guys and the different uh, things that you're discussing. Um, my mind goes a lot of places because of my own experience with this. Um, but having been a developer for so long in the past, I keep going back. There's an image on my on my mind all the time, which is the there's one. I don't know if you've seen it already or not, but there's like 12 guys around one person that is actually with a, a pickaxe doing a hole, and 12 telling them how to do it. And um, because I saw, this is the way to see the developer, um, he's the person that actually will help security resolve some of his problems. He's the one that's going to build the the software, and at the end of the day, uh, he will definitely not be as passionate as security people. Because I think that there's this, no, I wouldn't say evolution because it would be a, a path that I've chosen for myself, at least from passing to a developer to actually doing some security or attempting. But um, th there's not a lot of passionate security um, developers, not, not security, there's not a lot of passionate uh, developers. And they need to be passionate about what they do so that they can actually improve. So. Where do we actually fix that? And can we fix that people? Then there's different types of personalities as well. And I would go back towards the process and it would be the process that I would actually touch. But then again, I'm in a stage of my life where I'm doing a lot of process writing. So I'll be a bit biased towards that. But anyway, if you actually look at the maturity of the company or the development team, look at the way that they actually do things. And this is what you guys have been discussing as well. Then if you actually impose either with best practices or applying security tools or whatever it is, then we can actually achieve a better outcome. Um, and I, I think that is probably the best way to go because giving more stuff to developers and saying that that's the guy that actually is causing all of the problems, uh, it's not reality. Going to the university level, because um, we had that conversation as well, education, because I didn't have that background. I taught myself throughout most of my career. Um, I would like if, if, <laughs> to, to those developers and I had the chance to actually share this with people. If we got, I wouldn't even go to exploits. If we got to explain the difference of indirect inputs and indirect outputs and, and what they are, so direct and indirect inputs and outputs in a function, I wouldn't even go further than that. Just make people think about that. We would have better software. And, and that's my feeling. And it's a very small thing. It, not, it doesn't come from my mind. It comes from Chair of Mazaros, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly his book on X unit patterns, I think it is, or testing patterns. And when I actually share that, I saw code evol evolving in the better way. So it's not actually thinking of implementing, um, what do they call it? Security exceptions, there's a better name for it, but it's like you have a use case, when you write a use case, you're not actually writing something that will break so that you figure out if your code actually functions in the way that you expect it to function when it has, um, when the output, when the input is not what you expect, or even the yeah. output, so you know, small, small little things that will actually make a big difference. Actually, yeah, Andrea, loads to, of stuff here to observe. Go ahead, then. So, uh, so, so, what you said there about um, getting getting these developers, you know, excite, enthusiastic about this is is and kind of cross that with the stuff that Chris was saying earlier. So, I I I think that if you it's one of those things where there are a lot of developers that are not very passionate about security, but the ones that are passionate about security are really passionate about security. And using some of those techniques that Chris was talking about with those cool ninja mm -hmm. belts, which I'm stealing all day. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think if you elevate those people, they become role models in there. You want people to look up to them. And um, developers, you know, developers do look up to good developers. security champions, right? Security yeah, that's, champions. A, that's a whole other. That's yeah. a whole other thing. Don't get Ezar started on security champions. <laughs> that's a whole other open security summit talk, right there. Oh, smash. <laughs> All right, guys. So look, we, we passed the hour. Let's have some, some final thoughts on, on on this. I think we, we all we all valiantly agreeing that you know security training is very important. The question is how you do it and, and, and how you do it. So, Chris, final thoughts from your side. 
Yeah, I mean, first, thanks to James for teaching me something about uh, a way to measure people's happiness. Like, I'd never heard that before. So I'm going to go check that out because that's a really that's a really interesting thing. Like, let's measure the happiness. I'd like to measure the happiness of my developers as well uh, and yeah. throw some security questions in from that okay. perspective. But, you know, from from my perspective, it, it's all about the program. That's that's the success that I've had in my career yeah. in in educating developers is how do we and, and everybody around, you know, the SDLC, how do we how do we get um, how do we get that program that draws people in, gets them excited, rewards them, and gives them a path to be able to become educated and see the value in 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 putting that time in to learn about security? So for me, it's all about the program. Cool, Isa. Uh, I also learned a lot. Thank you guys very much. I, I think that uh, the the separation of the two levels of the program itself and the management of the program is starting to give me vibes that uh, somebody should come up with a training program for the people who will run the program. Oh yeah. Perhaps yeah. somebody who has done it, I don't know, a high company like Cisco, no idea, just saying. <laughs> but uh, that, that's something that I think that uh, people should, should would be uh, uh, open to. And I still think that uh, while we are asking for a lot from our developers in terms of time, we, we still have, a, a, we, we have done very good a very good job in uh, bringing the horse to the water, but now we have to make them actually drink. And I think that we have to look at some more alternative or out of the box thinking on how we can do that. Cool. Andre, any final thoughts? Okay, James. Um, I, I, I've, I've, I've learned quite a lot actually. I, I think I've. I, I love this stuff. I absolutely love this stuff. And I think um, I'm definitely stealing those ninja belts. Because <laughs> those are good. They are, they are good. I want one. I want one. And I don't, I don't even, I'm not even a developer that works there. Yeah, yeah. I think the final thing I would just say is when you were saying about developers, I think going back to Chris's point of culture, I think security training is to everybody. And, and we need to train everybody in security because the developers are not the only ones who impact this. So the more uh, I like this idea that we do it, we improving the security culture, and we and we should be measuring the security culture that from the happiness, from the outcomes, even how many hours are now added to a know a, 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 a sort of a, a sprint to to deal with some of these issues. Who is taking responsibility? Are there threat models being added? You know, even measuring right, measuring the number of vulnerabilities per per things. I feel I feel trying to do security culture asks a lot of great questions and make sure that we're dealing with the right altitude. So really great session. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Having, Thank you. having a, a great Friday. And I'll see you next time. Great weekend.